Hey friend, Graham here from recordingrevolution.com. Today, let's talk about panning your tracks when you mix. And I'm gonna show you the best way to pan your tracks. Now, I will qualify that statement by saying there is no right way, and this is just an art form, and this is creativity. We're just making music, we're having fun, we're creating art. So, you know, go bananas with your panning. <clears throat> the, the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and plenty of people when stereo was invented went crazy and did crazy weird panning stuff that we would never be caught dead doing today uh, if you wanted to have something on the radio or have something um, commercially viable. Uh, it's just not what we're used to anymore. And some of those records are, you know, timeless. So you can do whatever you want. Just saying there is a method to the madness. And I get a lot of questions about panning. And so I, I need to address it. First of all, if you don't know what panning is, well, when you open up a track like this and it hasn't been mixed and you've just done your volume, balance like I've done here. Uh, you also have another choice, which is if you look at, let's say, this bass guitar track here, there's a pan pot. Now, your DAW might have sliders uh, instead of a knob, right? Either way, it's the same thing. You can choose to place this bass guitar up the middle like it is now, or over here on the right, or over here on the left, or anywhere in between, right? And that's basic stereo, right? You really have two channels and then panning controls how much is in the left versus the right. So you have the illusion of this track being somewhat in between. Even up the middle is an illusion. There is no middle, right? Unless you're in surround sound, there's no middle speaker. So the fact that it sounds like it's coming out of the screen right now uh, is that you've got it equally the same volume in the left and the right. Okay, just some basic panning science. That's about as far as my, my knowledge takes me. Now, when it comes to creatively panning, why pan in the first place? Well, you don't have to. Um, in fact, you shouldn't rely on it. You should use EQ to get the clarity and the separation so you can hear everything right. EQ and volume, those are your big things. And compression will help too. Panning is icing on the cake because we do listen to music in stereo. We might as well take advantage of it. The problem is if you look at, uh, let's say, all of these tracks, and this is actually, I didn't get that one. All these tracks, this this artist did a lot of virtual instruments and a lot of um, samples. And so what I was given is a ton of stereo tracks. Everything is in stereo. So whatever pad or patch he played through, you know, it already had some panning built in. It's not a mono track like this bass. If you record a vocal, it's going to be mono, right? Because it's one cable plugging into one preamp. It's a mono signal. Uh, if you record a guitar part, it's going to be mono. If you record a bass, it's going to be mono. If you record a snare drum, it's going to be mono. Unless you're using samples. And then like in this case, the drums, I believe, were easy drummer or superior drummer or something like that. So the drum tracks themselves are stereo tracks. They might even have some ambience on them, which makes this even more confusing, which is why I wanted to use this song in particular for this video, because a lot of you are using stereo tracks that you got dumped out of your, excuse me, samples, samplers and your virtual instruments, and that's more the, the norm these days. So what do we do with this? If we just leave it all the way it is, it's gonna kinda all get lost in the shuffle. So I got a couple of these I needed to undo. If we take a listen, I want you to hear this song with no panning. Everything is just the way it came to me. Everything is hard left and right if it's stereo or up the middle if it's mono. Keep me closer. Right, so so cool things going on, but they're all just kind of getting lost up the middle. And what I like to do is take advantage of stereo fully and get as much width as possible to make my mix sound as big as possible. So that doesn't mean you put everything hard left and right. That actually doesn't work. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these stereo tracks, they're not really hard left and right. Let's take a listen and look at some of these, for example. Let's go to the hook. 
Let's listen to each one of these here. That's really up the middle. It's beautiful. It's kind of are all around. Mostly up the middle, but a little bit of the edges. That's mostly up the middle, but it has these little swirls on the edges, but most of the tone's coming from the middle. So this isn't actually very stereo. You notice that. So if you have a lot of stereo tracks, keep in mind they're not very stereo. So we need to actually be intentional and put things somewhere. So a couple of rules of thumb. One is kick and snare, always up the middle, right? There's no reason to put them anywhere else. And so that's where I'm going to put them. So kicks. Now, in this case, these are mono signals. There's no panning on them, but it, he dumped them out in a stereo track. So even though it's stereo, it's up the middle. You could just leave it stereo, or you could truly put it up the middle by taking both pan pots and putting them up the middle. It's going to sound the same because there was no stereo width on this. The stereo track is the same volume on the left and the right. So kick and snare up the middle. Bass, I always put right up the middle. This would apply to a bass synth also. Now, a lot of times bass synths are very wide, <clears throat> and it just depends on your style, but I kind of like to put bass, bass synths all the way up the middle and don't let them stay stereo because I want it to be concentrated up the middle, but that's a personal preference. I like bass to be right up the middle so it locks in with the kick drum, and then vo lead vocal up the middle. I need you, my playing check. Now, I'll start with those up the middle for sure. Now it gets interesting, so let's look at other stuff. Drum overheads are a good example. You're going to get them panned hard left and right by default, but I don't know if I should leave them there. I like the symbols. You got the sort of uh, ride on the left and the crash on the right. That's pretty wide. I want to leave my complete edges for the instrument, so I usually turn the, the overheads into about 50%, so they're not quite as wide. You get a little bit of space, but the reason is I like to treat the drums like a mono instrument, meaning the drums are in one place. If the drums are everywhere and nowhere at the same time, it's kind of trippy, and that can work, and there's nothing wrong if you go that direction, but if you want as much width and as clarity as possible, pick a place for your drums, man, and have them mostly mono, but, you know, kicks near up the middle, but then a little, just a little narrower stereo image on the overheads, uh, and then same thing with the toms. Let's see where the toms pan, let's get a uh, look at the toms here. Here's where all the toms are together. Here's a good example. Tom high, low, or middle, right? So what I will do is listen to the overhead and just see where the toms are placed in the overhead. I'm gonna widen these overheads out a little bit because they're actually narrower than typical. Now, I don't hear much panning at all in the overheads, which is strange. I wanted to be wonder if it's just something with that plug-in that he used. So what in that case, we can, if the high tom was coming from the left and then ending on the right with a floor tom or the tom low, I would pan it accordingly. But if not, you can make up your mind. So I'm going to put, and this is a trick, when you have stereo tracks, and you want, if you want that track to be all the way to the left, you have to put both pan pots or both sliders all the way to the left in a program like Pro Tools. Um, now, some DAWs, you just get a slider even on stereo tracks, which makes this easier. In Pro Tools, you got two knobs, so you have to just sort of play with the two to get the same thing. That would be hard left. Let me get, oh, here's the high tom. We moved it to the hard left. That's a little strange, although it's totally, totally workable. I, these days, like to keep it more in line with my overheads. So it's going to be slightly to the left. Then I'm going to put the mid tom right up the middle. And then I'm going to put the floor tom slightly right. See, if if one of the pan is all the way up the middle and one's on the hard left, it's going to be an in-between. It's going to be 50%. Right? And then put the overheads with it. So now there's a little bit of movement. If you wanted to go hard panning, you could totally do that. And that just depends on your style, what feels good in headphones to you. So I'm going to pan toms accordingly. 
and maybe I'll let the rooms be all the way wide out. Because that's going to be, I use a room track more as an energy track and an ambience track. So it's almost like a reverb where I'm going to get a little bit of width on it. Now we get to the interesting part. Let me teach you something called LCR panning. It stands for left, center, right. And the idea is you'll get more width and separation if you treat panning as only three spaces instead of the rainbow of variance in between. Get up the middle, hard left, hard right. Now that sounds sort of, you know, like I just speaking against myself because what I did here with the toms and the overheads was do an in-between. And that's because the toms and the overheads are still part of what I consider a mono drum. It's right up the middle with a smidge of width, and that's fine. But all the other instruments, you're going to get the crazier, wider mix if you just treat them as mono instruments and put them in specific places. So let's listen to the hook here and choose where these are going to go. Let's get to main part of the hook. I might put that right up the middle. Now I might leave the organ there. Let's see what this other track is here. So these two pads, instead of having them on top of each other and on top of the organ, what if I panned this one hard right and this one hard left. Now we get something a little bit more wide because we notice different things on the edges and they're not mushing together as much. Let's take a listen to everything together. I need you, my blank check, sugar pills and training wheels and I catch you. And let's go to this one where there's a lead synth in here. So let's put that up the middle. We could even put this one up the middle too, even though it's got cool panning. So here's, it's cool. But I don't know if I want all of that swirling around. I want to have a focused place for it. This one comes in a little bit towards the end. I might pan that over to the right to make it stand out. See what we're doing? We're choosing where are these things gonna go that we notice them and it all fills out the mix. And you could do the same thing with vocals. When the vocals come in, you'll notice there's some harmonies. Let's take a look at his vocals here. And they're cool, so you have a choice of where these go. If you have a lead vocal here, I need you, my blank check. You've got these background vocals here. I need you, my blank check. And you can choose to keep them up the middle with the vocal. I need you, my blank check. Perfectly valid, so it supports that. Let's see what it sounds like in the mix. I need you, my blank check. Or you could pan these out wide. What are these two? I need you. So you could pan those out and keep the harmony up the middle. I need you, my blank check. I need you, my blank check. Sugar pills and training wheels and. Or in this case, since I like the vocals primarily to come up the middle, I might have the distance and keep keep them a little bit tighter. I need you, my blank check, sugar pills and training wheels and I cash you, 
just to stand up every day. Every day. And this is just the process you go through. You get to pick and choose where they go, but think about it as you've got three distinct areas. Up the middle, which is going to be your most important things, your kick, snare, bass, and lead vocal. And then maybe a core instrument. It could be a guitar or a synth that kind of keeps those chord progressions going. And then the edges are just as important, but they support the middle. So if you've got thick guitars or you've got cool keyboard parts, can you put one main thing on the left and one main thing that complements it on the right and then fill in the gaps? You don't necessarily want to do a what I call the rainbow, where you see panning, where you've got one thing here at 89, one thing here at 67, 69, one's here at 20, 32. You're not going to notice those slight variants in panning, so it just kind of mushes together. You At that point, you might as well keep them as separate as possible. Keep something straight up the middle, something's hard left, something's hard right, and you'll get that width. And if you are unsure of what that should feel like, or you don't believe me, or whatever the case is, just be a student. Go pull up your favorite tracks that you've ever listened to, your favorite band, put on good headphones, and then grab a piece of paper, listen to a song or two, and start to draw out what you hear. So visually draw out what you hear. Where is the vocal? Where are the harmonies? Where is the kick drum? Where is that synth? Where's the keyboard? And notice how many things are on the edges versus up the middle versus in between. And that will give you sort of a map of how to pan things. Now, before you go, I want to give you something that's going to help you out because panning is just one small little thing when it comes to making records. It's really, really important that we get panning right, but it's not the only thing. It really is an icing on the cake for really getting your EQ and compression right in the arrangement underneath all of that before you mix. And so I've put together a six-step process that I use and teach for making songs, songs that are radio ready, songs that sound good and can compete with what your favorite stuff is sounds like. And so it's called my six steps to a radio ready song guide. It's just a helpful reference point for you. It's a simple PDF. You can read it in a few minutes. It's going to walk you through all six steps of the music creation process. And yes, there's six. A lot of times my students are skipping two to three of these on average. You're just jumping into recording and maybe mixing and maybe mastering but you're skipping three other steps. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's three more steps. I thought those were the three. No, there's six. And so it goes way, way back to the beginning. So I teach you what those six steps are, what order to do them in. But not only that, inside this guide, I walk you through some of my best tips and tricks and best practices for getting the most out of your song in each stage. So I want you to download it and read it and then apply it because your songs will sound better for it. It's absolutely free. Just go to radioreadyguide.com. Put the link here on the video. It's in the description box below as well. RadioReadyGuide.com. Get your download and make your music sound better. Again, panning is important, but it's one little tiny little piece in this massive machine of music creation. And it's fun, but I want to give you that map so you don't get overwhelmed and you have the best chance possible to make your song sound radio ready. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks for liking the video. Subscribing to the channel means a ton. And I'll see you in another video real soon.